Hi everybody, this is lecture number six. Uh, in the course of eight lectures, we already uh, had five of them where we discussed things which are, in my opinion, uh, have negative effect on object-oriented design and the, the quality of the design. Uh, I, I, recapped in the, I recap in the beginning of every lecture just to help you uh, stay, in the, uh, stay on track. So first we discussed algorithms. The algorithms are uh, something that we are trying to hide when we do object-oriented design. We're trying to uh, make the, the objects look like um, declarative things which are, which are uh, hiding the, uh, the internals of it and uh, we connect them together through uh, through their behavior which they expose. But uh, if you look at the program which is written in a good object-oriented style, you will not see the algorithm. You will not understand uh, by looking at it exactly how the program will, uh, will be executed. What is the, the entire algorithm? You will only see dependencies between objects. And this is a good thing. So we believe that, uh, I believe that um, if you don't see how objects interact exactly, then it, uh, uh, it helps you to stay on a higher level of abstraction, which means better understanding of, the, of a higher level of design and uh, you know, allowing you not to remember too many details, which usually lead to, uh, to bugs if you, if you focus on low-level stuff instead of thinking of higher level design. So, bottom line, algorithms are not... Uh, what we, uh, be, what we love in object in the programming. Second, we discussed in the second lecture, we discussed static things, static and static uh, methods and static attributes, which are, again, in my opinion, uh, are the, we, we inherited them from procedural programming. So they came to object-oriented programming, to object-oriented languages like C++. They came from languages like Algol uh, and um, the languages which are procedural. We should stay, we should try to stay away from them. Then we discussed uh, getters. Getters and then setters. So getters, we, I, I told you that it's good to hide data and expose behavior. So every object must hide as much as possible the details of the data and only expose the results of the some functionality which is inside the object. So you ask the object, you, you tell the object what to do, you don't ask the object to give you the data. That's why they call it tell, don't ask. So you tell it, and the object works for you and returns you back the result. Uh, then we discuss setters. Setters are um, the immutability. So I told you that immutability is something that uh, we do not uh, want to see in, uh, in uh, the, the mutability. We don't want to see. So we, we try. We need to try to design uh, objects in an uh, immutable, immutable way. And the lecture number five, we talked about ER objects, the, the class names and the object names which are which end with ER. So they are completely a procedural creatures which exist so so frequently in object-oriented programs, uh, especially in the MVC pattern and the object relation, relational mapping pattern as well. So we should stay uh, stay out of that. I tried to design these lectures the way that every second one is is discussing the things which are even worse and worse for object-oriented programming. So something we can, something that that you should uh, that you should uh, uh, try to to avoid uh, as much as you can. So now we discuss null. You probably know what it is. You know what is null, where it's coming from, and I will start with a very famous quote of uh, the guy who, uh, according to the information we have in public, invented this thing in the in the language called Algol. So that language was object-oriented, one of the first uh, object-oriented languages, Algol W. Uh, that was the language with object-oriented flavor, with some things, with some object-oriented things inside. And uh, long, many, many years later, actually 40 years later, uh, Tony, this guy, is saying that he was saying on one conference, you can you can click on this link later on the slides and you will see the full presentation. That's like actually a long, long talk, long presentation, more than an hour, where he discussed why uh, this was a big mistake to introduce this null into, into programming language. So you know what I'm talking about. So when you say in, for example, you say uh, book b equals to null. This is Java. So he's saying that that's a terrible mistake, which leads to errors, which leads to uh, 
innumerable errors, vulnerabilities, system crashes, and so on and so forth. And in this lecture, we'll try to explain you why it leads to errors, and not only why it leads to errors, but more importantly, why it leads to um, not so good design. So it, not, it, it, it actually directly leads to errors as well, because if you do this, and then you do uh, b.name, then obviously you're going to have an error, right? Because there's going to be null null pointer exception in Java, that's going to be uh, segmentation fault in, uh, or, or in, in valid reference or whatever in C, C++ language. So there will be a runtime error, which in compile time it's difficult to detect. So when we compile this program, then this program is perfectly valid. The compiler can compile it and you'll get the program and you run this program, but then it crashes. After it, uh, after it runs. Uh, we don't want that to happen, but it will happen and we will not see it. So it's, 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 it's hard to understand, uh, it's hard to detect these bugs because usually they don't stay together. So usually these two lines, they're not going to stay next to each other. There will be another 100 lines between them. And then this line happens and you know what, what's going to happen. Null pointer exception. And that's it. So it's a big problem, but again, I am focusing not on the practical implications of just assigning null, which you can read a lot of articles about that, but I'm, I'm going to talk about why it's bad for the design, why it actually um, makes your code uh, look, look wrong. Not while it will lead to the runtime errors, that it will. But this is not my key point. My key point is that the design that you will see, it will be less understandable, less maintainable. And actually, this entire course of lectures is, has the focus on the maintainability of the code. And I believe that this is the, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, virtue, the ultimate uh, you know, uh, outcome of a good programming style. So you can write your code in a bad style with, for example, using this, this kind of uh, you know, uh, statements. And you can write your code without using certain anti-patterns, which I'm trying to teach you. So there will be two pieces of code and they both can work. Because you know, this code will also work if you put here, for example, if b equals to null, then blah, blah, blah. So you can check for null and everything will be good. So there will be no runtime error. There will be no null pointer exception. So you can have null. Technically, it's possible. And many people will tell you that you should. So if you read the, 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 the articles on the internet, including mine are my articles, where authors say that null is a bad idea, you will always see the comments uh, at the, the discussion sections where people say, no, 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 it's not a bad idea in general. It's sometimes maybe a bad idea, but sometimes it's maybe a good idea. Sometimes you need it. So there is no point of just calling it just a billion dollar mistake. It's too harsh. You're just generalizing too much. It, it may be a mistake sometimes, but sometimes no. So my point is that there, you can write two programs and they're both going to work and you're going to use certain things here and don't use certain things there the ultimate result will be the maintainability. Maintainability is how easy it will be to edit those programs, to make changes in them. And if I can make changes faster, easier, spending less resources, then this program is better. And I believe that now, in these days, in this world where we live right now, this is much more important than all other qualities of the program, even this, the performance of the program, even the size it takes in memory, even the amount of resources it, cons it consumes. So what's more important is how easy we can edit the program, how clean is the code, how, I can, how fast I can read it, and that this is readability. So maintainability is like a large uh, non-functional uh, quality of a program, maintainability, how I can maintain it. So the life, lifetime of a program is much longer than, than the time when the programmer writes the program. So let's say you write the code that it takes you one month or two months and then you stop writing the code. But if you wrote something interesting, if you create the code which other people can use, then it will live longer than two months. It will live two years. It may live a, a ten years. 
And during this lifetime, it's a life cycle of a program. It's just the program is, let's say it's alive. Let's say it's a, it's a living organism and it lives for 10 years. Only two months you were actively participating in the development. The rest of the time you were not there. There are other people there. And it's important how easy for them it was to maintain your code. And if it was not easy, then it means your maintainability is low, then it means it's very, it's a bad, it, it's, a, it's a defect of the program. It's even more serious defect than the, the actual, you know, the actual functional defects and null pointer exception. We can fix the null pointer exception, we can fix the bug in the program, but if the entire code is hard to read, if the entire code is difficult to understand, it's unfixable. And it's, it costs us a lot of money to, to make changes, to live with this program. So fo we focus on that. We do all of this in this course in order to not to make programs work faster. In most cases, they will work slower. Like I told you, for example, with static methods. If you don't use static methods, but you use objects instead, your code will work slower. But you pay this price in order to get higher maintainability, in order to make this code work, uh, look better. Maybe work slower, but look better. And this is more important. And before we start about null, I would like, well, this is the structure of the lecture today, so I will first introduce you to this concept, which you may know, or maybe not. It's called fail fast, and uh, the opposite one is called fail safe. Then we're going to discuss how to return null, and how not to do it, how to check for null, and how not to do it, how to store null, and how not to do it null, null, let's say null. Uh, then we discuss the final point is object thinking, and then I will just give you a little... Um, a little taste about Spring Boot, where people actually use null, and that's, and that's, we're gonna shame them, right? How we do it with all others. So first start with fail fast and fail safe. So who of you actually know what it is? That would be nice if some of you do, but you need to know about this as a programmer. This concept is coming, these concepts, they're coming not from the programming world, but they were adopted by programmers, and that happened, uh, like 20 years ago. So this is quite famous paper in, uh, in this magazine, which you can read. There are just two pages, so you can read it easily. Just Google for the, for the name of the guy and uh, for the title of the paper. The title, the, title, the title of the paper is Fail Fast. Simple as that. Fail Fast. So the, the, the ultimate idea is this. Uh, there are two approaches to how you design your code. Well, I scroll down, but you need to read the article, so I, I hope you will do it yourself. So look at these two pieces of code. On the left side, you see fail-safe approach. On the right side, you see fail-fast approach. So what is the difference? In this code, we have similar methods, similar functions, uh, and they are supposed that the function size is supposed to calculate the size of a file. The file is an incoming parameter, an incoming argument, and uh, the file may not exist on the disk. So before I do the calculation of the length of the file, I do the checking. If the file doesn't exist, so what do I do? And there are two scenarios. Scenario number one is called fail safe. So I try to continue the execution of my code. I try not to fail at all cost. So definitely the size of the file is not zero, right? It's, it's, the file doesn't exist, so I don't need, I don't know what to answer. I maybe, I can return minus one. That's, some people do this. Or I can return minus uh, max, uh, I can return, I don't know, minimum integer. Something like that. So people, people try to survive with all possible means. I do it here, I just return zero. It's called fail safe. I am I'm trying to I'm trying to make my code safe so it doesn't crash the, the, the program. It doesn't crash it, the program continues. And this is fail fast. Fail fast is different. Look, the same function file, it also accepts the file as a parameter and then it says if the file doesn't exist, I just throw an exception. So I crash the execution. In this case, I try on the left, on the left scenario, I try to survive. And this one, in this one, with this approach, 
I try to die. I try to kill the program. I do. It may sound really weird to you, but this is exactly the idea. So I'm trying to crash the program as early as fast as possible, as fast as possible. That's why the name fail fast. Don't wait until it's too late because something definitely goes wrong here. If the file is coming here as a parameter, but it doesn't exist on disk, it means that the situation is already abnormal. Already we are in trouble. So we don't try to survive. We try to crash fast before it's too late. And actually this idea is coming from business concepts. So fail fast, you can see that in the, you can see that in the business where people say that, uh, you, you, people say that uh, when you start doing business, for example, you don't want to continue too long before you understand that you're completely out of money, for example. So you try to fail fast. So you build a prototype. Let's say you want to make uh, a new, you want to make a, a new software which is uh, which is gonna be uh, bought by people who will use it and pay you a lot of money. So you just make this software, but you don't make it for many, for, for, for many, many years, waiting for the money to come. You just try to make a prototype, give it to, to trial users, see the feedback, and if the feedback is negative, you stop doing this business. You do somewhere, you do something else. So you try to fail fast before it's too late. The same here. So we definitely will crash sometime, eventually, maybe. We don't know for sure, because maybe if I return zero, maybe this result is not used anywhere. So let's say they just uh, calculate the size of the file, print it to, to, to console, and just exit. So in this case, returning zero will not lead to errors. Just the zero will be printed. The user will be confused. The user will be just scratching the head and saying, like, why are you telling me that the size of a file is zero while the file is not there? So the, it's just slight confusion will happen, but no runtime error. When I run this code, there will be a crash. There will be a stack trace on the screen and the user will get nothing. Not zero, nothing. So we are trying to make the code as fragile, that's the right word here, fragile, as possible. So it runs, but at any opportunity, at any opportunity, when it's possible to crash, you crash. You don't wait. You don't say, eh, maybe let's, let's not check the, whether the file exists or not. Maybe we can remove this check in, entirely. And say, eh, let's not check it because who knows, maybe let's try to, let's hope that even if the file doesn't exist, maybe something good will happen. No, you just see the opportunity to make a check and throw an exception, do it. So you make your code eventually fragile. It, 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 you, you put it to production, users start using it and it crashes. It fails here, there, you get errors, you get errors. And this is what leads to higher quality. The write snippet is more fragile, leading to more errors in runtime, but eventually leading to less bugs. Why? What's the logic here? The logic is that if you do fail safe, if you try to conceal the problems, you try to hide the problems, then they, they, mm, they stay there for longer. So let's say you ship the code to your, you develop the software, then the software is of some size. And there are, let's say, 100 critical bugs in your software. 100. We don't know where they are. We don't know what is the total size of bugs, because most probably it's unlimited. So there are, in any software, an unlimited number of bugs. But we know, we, we can predict that there's 100 critical bugs, which definitely will lead to runtime errors in simple scenarios. So you ship this code to customers. Your goal as a developer is to discover these 100 bugs as soon as possible. Not to forget about them and wait until one of them will show up in three months. But you want to see these bugs as soon as possible. Today, tomorrow, while you're still sitting in front of the computer and while you still have time to fix them. So you... Because of that, you make your software as fragile as possible. You give it to the customer, the customer run it, the bugs will happen, the, the error reporting will happen. You fix those bugs and you remove these 100 bugs sooner rather than later. So making software fragile, you increase the quality because it, this fragility helps you 
discover the problems earlier. And not only discover, but not to and, and make the discovery easier. Because when I see, this is actually a, a, a good comment from, from one of you, uh, you're saying that we're not only uh, uh, crashing here, but we're also making the, the error more obvious. So when I do this, when I check the file size, the message which I send here can give more information to me as a, as a, as a, as a developer than if I just return zero and this zero goes somewhere else and then there will cause a trouble which will be difficult to understand. Because here the problem will be easy to understand. And I'm just saying, look, you're asking me to calculate the, file, the size of a file, but I cannot because file is absent. At this point of time, it's the, the exception, the message of the error will be very informative. While in this case, if I return zero and everything will look like, okay, the program continues to work, the error will happen later, maybe a few minutes later. And then there will be a really surprising error, which will be hard to understand, hard to understand the meaning of this error. So the comment is right. We're not only trying to crash, we're trying to avoid future misunderstanding of the cause of a problem. We make the cause obvious. Let me show you another example, which is very, very popular in the uh, software development community. For some reason, people continue doing this, even though in every book on, on software quality, people, uh, the authors, they say, don't do it. So look at the code on the left. It's a very typical scenario. You try to read the content. This is the file. The, the parameter is coming in. So we're trying to read the content of a file. So I'm saying files read bytes. Here, it's possible that the exception will, will be raised by this code. It's in Java. So what do I do? I catch the exception, I print the stack trace, and, okay, that's a mistake, so in this case I do return, return, I don't know, something. So this is caused, this is called swallowing the exception. We just swallow, like, the exception happened, I don't give it to anybody, I just swallow, okay, I forget it, continue the execution. And this is a terrible anti-pattern. Terrible. You don't do that. It's anti-pattern. When I interview programmers who want to join my team, I usually show them the code which looks like this. And I ask them, do you see any problems in this code? And if the programmer doesn't say that, hey, come on, that's a terrible mistake, you don't do that, then it's not a good programmer. This is, this is what you should, if you see this, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you can see even this. Sometimes you can see even the no line here. That's a lot of code in Java written like this. So you just open the, the bracket, close the bracket, and nothing happens. Not even printing the, uh, the exception stack trees. Just completely swallowing, and nobody will ever see that the exception happened here. That's, that's completely terrible. And this is called, of course, fail safe. So we fail safely. There was an exception. We were not able to read the content from a file. We don't tell anybody. Instead, we should do this. We should try to read the file and then we catch the exception and then we throw. And this is called, if you know, this is called re-throw. Or a more formal term, I would say. This is escalating. So you're staying here. You see the problem. What do you do? You don't know what to do. You escalate it to the upper level. You just tell the user who called you, the, the client, not the user, the client, the, the code which, which was calling you. You just say, I don't know what to do with the mistake. Maybe you know. So I stop. I don't continue because the error happened. So you deal with that. And then the, my client who called me can also escalate, can also say, I don't know what to do with that. I escalated to the upper level. And then it's going to be escalated, escalated, escalated. At some point of time, it will go to the higher level of a program. And then at the higher level, we interact with the user. And at that point, we tell the user, hey, the error happened. Please send this email to the developers. We can log the exception. We can email the exception. So something will happen on the higher level. But this escalation should happen. But if lower level guys will swallow the exception, then the escalation will not happen and the user will never know about this bug. The bug will be concealed, the bug will be hidden and it will only degrade the quality. All right, now I see the question in the chat. If you decide, I'm reading the question, if you decide, if you decline the responsibility to handle the error in place, 
then who should take care of this? Runtime errors are not predictable. That's exactly what I just explained. So yes, we, we do not take care of the errors on our low level. We just escalate them higher and higher and higher. On the higher level of the application must stay exception handler, some guy, some, some piece of code, which is called um, uh, ex exception handler. And this handler will catch all exceptions that are coming from all the lower levels and do something with them. What it's going to do? It will report to the user. It will report to the end user through the UI, through the command line, through the logging files, from all the different uh, instruments and, um, and uh, channels. So let me summarize, because I'm finishing about this fail fast. You just need to understand this fail fast. It's a fundamental concept for uh, for program for software development, for software engineering. It's not only related to object-oriented programming. You just need to, uh, to apply to every area of software engineering. Make your software fragile. Make it fail. Failures are good for quality. If your software don't fail frequently enough, especially when it's still in the draft, when it's still uh, being developed, then you are doing too much error hiding and you don't want that. So this is the development cycle. So like I told you, this is how it should look for you as a developer. You develop some code. Uh, you develop some code. So this is the start. So you create your software. You create the software. Then you deploy it to your customers. You give it to users. It could be you. It could, doesn't necessarily need to be uh, some foreign customers. It could, could be you. So you just develop some prototypes. You try it using it. So you deploy you, you put it in your hands and then you start using it. You start using it. You use it and you see problems. You see problems, you report them. You report ticket number one. The bug is description goes here. For example, I click the button and I see, and I see error, blah, blah, blah. You describe the error. This is the first ticket which you created. This is the report. Then you fix the ticket and then you deploy the new version and you again try it again. Try to use it. Again, you report ticket number two. And then again, report, fix, deploy, use, report, fix, deploy. Sometimes you may skip the report phase and just go directly from use to fix. But I would not recommend doing this. I would recommend to always report and report. And the more bugs you will have, I don't know, 1,000 bugs, the more bugs you report and fix, the higher will be the quality of code. Because remember, when you first create the code, there is some amount of bugs right there. For example, there are 100 bugs, critical bugs. Again, critical. We don't know how many are there other bugs, because there are definitely millions of them, non-critical. But we definitely can predict and that's, that's, that could be predicted, the amount of critical bugs. So your goal as a developer is to run this cycle as many times as necessary in order to fix 100 critical bugs. You will do it many, many times, but you will have 1,000 of them fixed, but maybe only, I don't know, 72 of them from here are critical. So 28 will remain hidden. They will stay even though you run this, this cycle for a thousand times, you test, you try, you use, you test, you try, you fix, 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 and 72 critical bugs you will fix. What are other 28? You don't know. You don't know where they are. You don't have this information, but they are there. They exist. So what you can do, you can run more and more cycles and you can make your program more fragile. Fragility will help you discover these bad guys. If your code is not fragile, if your code is hiding the errors, then you will never discover important bugs. That will be very difficult for you. That's another comment that the handler has the ER suffix, handler. That's right, that's a good comment. Yeah, handler is not a good name, so it's better. I actually don't call it handler, so it's better to call it application. So, at the, you, as remember, the object-oriented design, one object, another object, another object, larger object, another object, another larger object, larger object, some other object, and this is the larger object. And then we have a final object, which is called, I don't know, APP. So in this APP, in this application, there you catch, you catch 
everything that is coming from from these guys they report to here they report to here they report to here they report to here so they escalate 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 and finally the final object catches everything and everything is great okay so this is called fail fast idea which is important so null was invented to do fail safe take a look at this code I am trying to get the name of an employee from the database. So this is my method, name of an employee. So I get the ID of the employee. And then I go to some entity manager. Let's say I'm using object relational mapping just for the sake of this discussion. So I check, does it exist in a database by the ID? If it doesn't, look what happens. So instead of returning the string, Instead of returning the name of the employee, I return null. This is, as you understand, is called, is called fail save. Why fail? Because I didn't find it in the database. So they're asking for the name of an employee and they give me the number. So they already assume they, they're, who is coming to me. So they already assume that the employee exists. That's why they give me the number. And that's why they asked for the name. They didn't ask me to check. They didn't say, if the employee exists, then get the... They just say, give me the name of this guy. What do I do? I, I, but the guy doesn't exist. So what should I say? Return null. A bad programmer will do this. A very bad programmer will do that. You don't do this. And this is called fail safe. A good programmer will, will throw an exception. And maybe even give a, a name for this exception, employee not found exception. So this is clearly the end, the, the situation is clearly out of control. It's abnormal situation because you're asking for the name of employee. So you have an assumption that the employee exists, but your assumption is wrong. That's a critical situation. Something is wrong here. Not with me. It's not my fault. I mean, if I am this method. It's a fault of this guy who is calling me. So this is the client who is coming to me. And this client has a wrong assumption. So my job, my duty is to report to this guy and say, hey, I have no idea what's going on. Something is really wrong because you're just asking me what I cannot answer. But doing this, absolutely not. Why? Because if we, if we talk technically, then of course we can imagine that it could be like this. The name, you get the name name equals name of employee 42 and then you say i don't know n dot trim for example if it's java and then boom you have null pointer exception null pointer exception npe so that's that's horrible but this is again these are technicalities they're just runtime problems but more importantly is that how it looks when i read this code I will immediately, if I look at this, I will immediately say it's a wrong code. You don't write it this way. Returning null is absolutely a prohibited, completely <laughs> disallowed way of writing object-oriented programming code. You never, ever return null. You may raise an error, but this is not the only option. We will discuss other options as well right now. Raising an error, in my opinion, is the best option. Because you clearly understand that the situation is abnormal. Abnormal. And my duty is the report abnormality of the situation. Like I said, to make it fragile, the faster I report about this, the better. Second option. What do we, can we do if we... Uh, again, the same code here. You saw that code before. This is not an option, as you remember. We don't do that. This is terrible, horrible. What do we do? We can return a list of names. So we say, give me the name of employee. But look, I ask for the name, but I return a collection. And it's a collection of one element. So basically, it's uh, the size of this collection is uh, uh, either 0 or 1. It's either an empty collection or a list. Or it's a collection with one element inside. So in this case, we are sort of 
making the client responsible for the, for the problem. So if the client is coming to us and say, give me the name of the employee, we have a freedom to return an empty collection, which will be, of course, a concealing of error. It's going to be sort of a fail safe, right? Because the client will never know. Well, the client will know. Right, the client will know if I return the empty collection, then the client will understand that something went wrong and I was not able to find the name of an employee. But the client will never know what exactly went wrong. Maybe the employee doesn't have a name in a database. Maybe the ID of the employee is wrong. Maybe the database is down. Maybe the connection to the database is up, but the password is not working. So there are many, many options which may happen. But the client will just get an empty list. It's definitely not a good design if you do it this way. It's better than returning null. It's definitely better than this ugly code. Again, this is absolutely no go. But this one is a little bit better. You see how I, how, how I do it. I do list, whatever, whatever. In, in, in languages like Java, they have the, the class already, the class specifically made for, for this in Java 8 and further versions. They have the class optional. So you can use instead of list, you can use optional. But before Java 8, we were doing list. We were doing list, collections, sets, all kind of stuff. Just a, just a holder, maybe arrays. It could be an array with a... Uh, with one element or two elements in Java, it's possible to do it this way. So you kind of return something to try to avoid null. Why? Why it's better? Because uh, because the null point, null pointer exception will not happen. The client will take the result, and the client cannot immediately call uh, some method on this result. The client need to take something from the collection. Of course, if the client is not smart enough, the client may do like this. It may write. Uh, let's say names equals to name. This is a name of employees, number 42. And then it may say names dot get zero dot trim. So here we're going to get null pointer exception. Because, we're, well, not, no, sorry, it's not going to be null pointer exception. There will be the error here will be. So when you will try to get the, 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 the element, uh, the first element from the collection, there will be no, no elements, something like this exception. No elements exception. I don't remember. Something like this. No elements exception. So there will be, boom, I don't have the element in the collection. Still an error. But at least it will be the responsibility of, a, of the client. So why are you taking the, why do you make this assumption that the collection has something? Please check first. It's a great gray area solution, but it's still a solution. People do it. I made a tweet some time ago, actually, you see, five years ago. So five years ago, I posted a tweet and you see how many um, answers I got there. And the question was, you can read it. You're designing a method, find user by name, which has to find a user in the database. What would you return if nothing is found? So you can see how people answer that. So, see, unfortunately, the majority of programmers on Twitter voted for the option number four, which I just described to you, which in my opinion is not the best option. So I voted for this. But, well, you see how many people do this. Every programmer out of four do this garbage style of programming. That's what we have in the industry right now. So people believe that this is a good programming style. I mean, that hurts. That's not good. But I'm glad to see that another quarter of, of the audience, they actually understand that they need to throw an exception. This is not good. These people, I think they are just... They, they're in the they're in the middle. <laughs> they're not they're not fail safe. They're not fail fast. They're just somewhere in the middle. But I'm interested in these guys because I believe that this solution is not as radical as throwing an exception immediately, but it may give us a lot of interesting opportunities for dealing with errors in a more effective way. And I'll show you what I mean. So instead of returning null, again, this is the ugly code, return null, you don't do this. 
never ever never ever let me remove this code again this that's not good so look what happens e employee 42 i rename the method employee 42 then i do print e id print e salary so you can see that in this case we're going to get here null pointer exception Null pointer reception, which will not tell us what's going on. You will just see on the common line on the, on the on the logs, you will see null pointer exception. Not the message that the user was not found. No, you're not gonna see that. You will not understand why you're getting null pointer exception. You will just see that that it something crashed. So that's that's not good. Look at the right example. Look what I'm doing. If, yeah, look what happens if I find the user. If I find the user, I return some, some instance of this class, which is called PG employee. PG stands for Postgres. Postgres. Post. So this, like we discussed, it's a SQL speaking object. So this is the employee with the ID. So actually when I see, when I call in a normal evaluation flow I call e.salary so here probably the SQL query will go to the database and uh, that, that salary will be calculated the database will return some number I don't know $25 and uh, and this $25 will just boom here and print it there like number 25 everything is good look how I modified the code instead of throwing an exception I return so-called fake employee so fake employee is the same as PG employee, but it does not go to the database. It does not know anything about the database. It only knows a very limited amount of functionality which an employee is supposed to expose. For example, it knows how to print the ID because the ID was just given to it. Look, we just encapsulated the ID. So obviously the fake the fake fake employee can easily print EID. So no NPE here. No error. Fake employee will be good enough for us for a simple case. But when the case becomes more complex, fake employee will throw an exception here and it will say hey i am a fake employee a fake employee number 40 number 42 i don't have a salary why i am fake employee? why i am fake because and the explanation which we can also encapsulate here if we want so this fake employee may be a very smart object very clever with a lot of information inside which we encapsulate when the problem happens it will be just a it will be just an employee like an employee which can go further in the program which can live in the code for many hours until somebody touches the method salary and when that happened, then at that point of time, quite delayed from, from the execution of this method, the runtime error will happen with a very detailed explanation of what happened here seven minutes ago. It will say, yeah, seven minutes ago, this fake employee was, we, were, we tried to retrieve the employee from the database, but we failed because the database was down or whatever. But it was okay at that time to just remember the ID of the employee. But unfortunately, sorry, right now you're asking for the salary. So now it's time to crash. So you're kind of delaying the moment of failure, which is not good for fail safe. So definitely it's not as good as throwing an exception. So again, I'm voting for this, definitely, because this is fail fast. You fast as you fail as, sorry, you fail as fast as possible this is the key word here fast don't wait but in this case we wait in case of a fake employee we wait we wait sometimes so we're trying to we're trying to 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 survive so it's again it's a it's a borderline uh, solution
but it's definitely better than than null. So I'm just I'm just showing you the alternatives to null. Returning null is bad, but these are these are three alternatives: empty list, throwing an exception, making a fake user, fake uh, fake entity. Okay, so that's it about returning null. That's all I wanted to say. Let's continue. Alternatives to checking for null. So here we have a. I will show you some examples of how to deal with null and how it happens in uh, in modern programming languages. I'm not I'm not writing in C sharp, but I know that they have the so-called null call asking call asking. I don't know how to read this right. Call asking, I think, call asking operator in C sharp. So look at the code on the left. This is so C sharp is more advanced language comparing to Java because it knows how to deal with null with more uh, with more uh, how to say uh, with more features, more additional features for that. Because in Java we just have null. You can assign null and you can read null, and that's it. In C sharp you you can say that in my method. When I check the size of a file, then I return integer, but I can also return null. And because of this, we put the question mark here. So the question mark means the integer will go out or null. And null means that if the file doesn't exist, then look what happens. I return null. And then in the code, you will say, again, it's a nullable variable. So S may contain null say size of and then you say if s equals to null then let's say s equals to zero very stupid code you don't do this but still but they introduced another operator which makes it better makes this code shorter so again this ugly code here again the same question mark but look at this one this is the operator i'm talking about so you say size of and then the question mark which means exactly the comparison on the left so it stays like if what you see on the left equals to null, then return zero. Otherwise, return this. In my opinion, it is only making the situation worse. So this design introduced by C sharp is only they are instead of instead of helping programmers to get rid of null, they are making instruments for programmers to work with null and to believe that this is good. So if they take away, if they would, the language, if they would take away the null from the language and they would say don't use it, then that would be a good message to programmers that actually null is a bad idea. But instead they introduced the instruments to, to help us deal with null. I don't think it's a uh, it's good for the for the language design let me read the question you have if for instance we have something coming from api that we parse to entities where several fields may be null is it okay to use optional in this case something is coming from the api that we parse uh, to entities several fields may be null uh, well, you definitely have, we definitely may have in the API, we may, may have some optional parameters. So let's say you allow your users to query something from you. And then in this query, they, they ask for the, I don't know, the name of the user in the database, of the, of the, the name of the department. And then they say, uh, I don't know, the, the year of joining and then this year is null. So I, I, they either provide the year or they don't provide. Uh, well, first I have to say it's not a good design of the API. So it's better to not do this and I will show you in a minute uh, to confirm what I'm saying that I, I think it's not a good idea to have one entry point with optional parameters. If you want to have if you want to have an option to provide the parameter or not provide, create two entry points. Create one entry point where users are supposed to provide the parameter, another one where they are supposed to not provide the parameter. 
But sometimes it may not be so easy. Uh, it's easy to say, but sometimes the design may be not as as easy. But but it should be. It, it should be like this. I I am sure that in most cases or in all cases you can do that. Maybe in this case, maybe in order to do this, you need to break down your your API into multi-step request. So instead of making just one large entry point where users can provide you five different parameters and then you you parse them and then you understand which one is provided and which one is optional. Instead of that, you can do multi-step uh, requests. So first of all, they, they ask you, give me the entry point where just one parameter is provided. They say, okay, here's the entry point. And then you say, okay, now I provide another parameter. So give me another entry point. So they return you another location where you submit another one. So it's like one, two, three, four requests. And in the end, you get to the position where you... Yeah, where you get the, the results. So, but in this case, it will be slower. Again, you see, we we uh, we sacrifice uh, the performance for the sake of readability. Not always it's possible. Sometimes you will need to have five parameters, and then you parse them, and then you some of them are not uh, provided. So, but I still believe that storing null in this case, null in this case, is not a good idea because now we are on the level of Java already. So people provided us some parameters, some of them are null, but it doesn't mean that on the level of Java or whatever language you use, then at this level we need to use null. We still have an option not to store null, and I will discuss it in a few minutes, how not to store null inside your object. Uh, so the extension of the question, uh, the author of the previous question is saying, for instance, entity message having reply ID for the messages that were sent as reply and reply ID must be optional. Assume that I cannot influence API design anyhow. Uh, so the entity message, uh, we have message and uh, having reply ID. And were sent as reply. Reply ID must be optional. So we are so something is coming to us, and this something is a message with the optional, with the optional reply ID. And then we need to store it in the in the Java in the Java object. Well, I would suggest to make uh, on the level of Java. One object is called message. Another object is message with reply or maybe a better name I would call it this one will be called uh, message and this one will be called response so don't mix them together somehow this reply ID make a difference in one object it is set in another object it's not set so why do you think it's the same object why do you think it's the same entity an entity with reply ID and an entity without reply ID. There are different things. They may behave similar in some situations, but not in all situations. So that makes them some common parent they probably have. And then they, this is one is the, let's say it's original message. And this one is response. And this response probably has a link to the original message. So that's the, the, the design of types. They have definitely some common type and they, they possess the quality of this common type, but they are different. And the existence of this guy inside actually tells us that they must be different. So don't think of objects as storage of data which most of us think. So we are trying just to put everything. We're trying to mimic, we're trying to copy the world which we see by making objects, by, by making data structures and calling them objects. So the message is coming to us, the message has five, five properties, and we're saying, okay, now we're going to make an object which also has five fields. Well, that's not right. You need to think about what is the message, why these five properties are there, what they mean, and then structure the, the and then design your classes, design your types, so that they 
uh, have different uh, different uh, semantic. Uh, the continuation. So uh, the author is saying, I thought of the, the such a design, but there are too many optional fields and therefore combinations of them. So it would be more than ten different classes for this entity. In case of Telegram API, for to be precise, if you have many uh, many uh, many things here then uh, then you need to start thinking about uh, not calling them fields anymore so in this case if let's say okay your in your case let's say the message is coming and the message is uh, the message is coming and it has 10 different fields the reply id the text the time the you know the date the the priority the blah 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 blah, blah all of this so don't make this is a clearly this clearly is a data structure. Don't represent it in Java as a Java object. Represent it as a hash map. I would do it this way. As a hash map. But calling them, calling them fields and assigning them to null, it's, it's not good. Their data, you're dealing with a hash map. You're dealing with associative array. The array of uh, of names, which are keys, and the values which are objects or just plain data. In Java, it's not really elegant because Java they have they have their hash map, which is in, in languages of a higher level like Ruby, Python, JavaScript. Uh, they have instruments for just plain data structures to use them. Okay. Okay, let's move a little bit further to Ruby. In Ruby, they have this operator, this special operator. So look at the code on the left. I keep I keep showing you Ruby code because I love this language. I think it's quite. Uh, I think it's um, among all the popular languages. I think JavaScript and Ruby these are the two languages which are the most object oriented. So they are the closest to the idea of object orientation. Java is definitely not one of them. JavaScript and, uh, and Ruby, these are the two guys who are, who are the most, they, they have the cleanest design and the most, uh, uh, the most uh, in my understanding, uh, most object-oriented. So look at the code on the left. We ask for the employee. We again do the same as we did before. So we have, we provide the ID and then if it doesn't exist, we return nil. In Ruby, it's not null, it's nil. Actually, in different languages, you can see this null defined differently. For example, in uh, JavaScript, they also have undefined, uh, which is something similar to null, but uh, with a little bit different semantic. In Ruby, they have nil. So the database doesn't have the employee, so it returns nil. And then if it's not nil, then it returns database, get by ID, so we find uh, whatever, some, some sort of an employee. So how it works? E equals to employee number 42. And then I print E dot name unless E equals to nil. So this unless, this is the keyword. So we are checking for nil. So this is the, the semantic here, E dot nil, question mark. So this uh, specially built in the language. The, this, the, the, uh, it's like a, it's like a, it's like an attribute, like a method of every object uh, in Ruby built in, and it checks whether the E is, is nil. So if it's not nil, then it prints E name. So pretty good, uh, pretty good, pretty simple piece of code, but you can make it even more simple. The same code here, and look what they introduced in the language. You put this operator here. You said, you put ampersand dot name. So you get the employee from the database, and then if it's not nil, then print, then call name. But this code will produce different output. You see, I'm saying here, the snippets produce different output from the employee. So how they're different? So think, so what, how they, they're different, the left code and the right code. So what exactly will be printed on the left and what on the right if the employee is not found? So in this case, this entire statement will be skipped if the employee is nil. So here we're going to see nothing in the console, nothing. Here it will start 
the puts will definitely start and then it will go if it's nil then instead of doing dot name it will replace this by nil so basically it's it's, it's going to happen like this it will print put nil which will print to the console i think it will print nil but i may be wrong so maybe it will also print nothing but here you can experiment yourself but i believe the nil will be printed something like that probably maybe i'm wrong maybe nil will be printed if i do not put but p this is another operator in in, uh, in ruby just letter p and then it will print nil but maybe puts will print just nothing just no output will be printed so maybe i'm wrong maybe they're not different i stand corrected here okay another interesting programming language who of you ever tried kotlin this is like a um, a more modern and a more elegant in some way alternative to java it's a language which compiles to bytecode and uh, actually it was created in russia uh, maybe 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 eight years ago maybe something like this maybe 10 years ago around that time and uh, it's quite popular it's used in uh, mobile development mostly uh, google is widely supporting this language so i if you didn't try it you you i highly recommend it to try even though i'm not writing in kotlin but they have interesting operators they have interesting approach to null again in my opinion it's not strategically good to encourage programmers to deal somehow with null but at least they try to put some limitations in this programming language they put some limitations on the null which uh, prevent programmers from uh, from making uh, from making mistakes Look at the code first line. We have the variable a, we assign abc, and then we try to assign null. We get the error, compile time error. So the compiler understands that a was declared as a variable which will never ever hold null. And if people, if the programmer declares the variable this way, then further down the code everywhere in all the places, uh, null will not be uh, possible to, to save there. A or you can declare this variable by attaching the question mark to the type. So it's the same type string, but the question mark, in this case, assigning null, no problem, no error. And they have a so-called Elvis operator. You probably know this guy. If you don't, you can Google. So this Elvis operator, it, it's called Elvis operator because it looks like Elvis haircut. So it basically uh, says first in this line b question mark dot length so in this case it will get the length of the b if b is not null that's the same as we had before in in ruby something similar but in ruby it was like this dot but in uh, in kotlin we have question mark dot so what is going to print here i think if if b is null then here we're going to print nothing well again depends on the on the semantic of print of this function print line but here it's it, it is checking b length if b is not if b is not null but if it is null then print minus one in general this elvis operator is a is a, is a replacement for uh, when you say for example if a then uh, no. if a then a else b this one is replaced by a b this and this is equal but this is always operator so we just repeat twice a and a you see I say a, a. In order to avoid this duplication, people invented this operator. So it just makes code more compact. But not all languages support this Elvis operator. Not all. I think in, in Java we don't have it. But in Kotlin we have. Okay, let's continue. 
another problem with uh, storing null. So take a look at the object which we discussed uh, before. This is the problem of immutability and this is related to the questions you just asking me about how to store null. So the code on the left is a class employee which has a mutable mutable field name mutable why mutable it doesn't have the final modifier so this equals to null if you know java this can be skipped because by default by default all uh, mutable fields by default null is assigned there but i i wrote it here just for uh, clarity so you see what happens so when the object is created when i do this when i write this statement here e dot name is null at this line and then I do e set name Jeff and then I assign something there okay that's the mutable object we discussed on the previous lectures how it's bad it's bad for everything it's bad for maintainability it's bad for uh, for concurrency it's bad for um, for side effects everything so a better alternative is to make this employee the employee name final. In this case, nobody can change the name of an employee after the class is instantiated. And we introduce a constructor. We introduce a constructor which expects the name at the moment of the object instantiation. We make an object, we need to provide the name. We cannot skip that. We need to provide the name. And then we can modify it. If you want to modify the name, we cannot do here, we can do set name. It was Jeff. Okay, now I want Mary. Yeah, my employee was called Jeff. All of a sudden, his name is Mary, and it's not he, it's she. Nice. So this mutation is possible if the class is mutable. And of course, it's a terrible design because it leads to confusion. The programmers will not understand what's next. It was Jeff, now it's Mary. So what happens to other fields? Do I need to modify them as well? That's just... a a mess. In this case, it's not a mess. We make an employee. Ah, sorry. Uh, I need to provide that. That's my mistake. So the Jeff is mandatory here. And here I can say Mary. Okay. And then this employee one and this is employee two. So there are two different employees. We don't touch the Jeff. The Jeff stays Jeff. But we create another one, rename it and set Mary. What happens to other fields? Maybe there are other fields there, so can we just switch to Jeff to Mary in just one go? We can if this method allows that. So all the modifications of the fields, other fields, will happen here, where we you see we create new employee. So if we want at the same time, let's say, let's say we have another field, for example, name, and we put another field here, uh, let's say uh, gender. So that would be really funny if we create an employee, set name, and then set gender, and then we set gender male, and then it's Jeff, everything is cool, and then we say set name Mary, so what do we have in the end? We have an object with the name Mary and gender male. That's a confusion. Why? Because we just forgot to call set gender here, and to set it to female. We forgot it. And because of this, we have a confusion. Here, we cannot forget this, because with this, with the method with name, the designer of the class employee will think about this and will put all the necessary modifications in here. You want to change the name? Okay, provide the gender, please. So probably the design of this method with name will be changed and uh, it has to accept the second parameter, for example. If we care about the, the matching of the name and the gender, then this, uh, this matching will be embedded, this requirement will be embedded into the design of the method which modifies, which creates a new employee. Make sense? Uh, slide number, is the question coming? Slide number 19, is it a builder? I thought this is a terrible concept, uh, the builders. It, it is, it's not really builder. Builder is something else. Builder is a mutable, uh, mutable design pattern where we have the, uh, the holder of some fields, which we modify one after another. We say this set, this set, this set, this, and then in the end we say build. And then when the builder is completely, uh, has all the fields prepared, 
and all the data is ready, then the builder makes an instance of some class, injecting all the data in there. This is what builder is doing. So builder is created for very ugly objects with multiple parameters in the constructor or just mutable objects with multiple parameters. So in order to make life of programmers easier, they make builders and they look like this. For example, imagine I have a class, uh, I have a class called uh, employee. And I have name, and I have gender, and I have salary, and I have age, and I have, uh, I don't know, department. I have one, two, three, four, five parameters. So one option is to make a constructor. The constructor with five arguments. But that's too long. It's a huge constructor. And people will say, we don't need all five. Sometimes I just need an employee with two parameters. Sometimes I just need an employee with three parameters. It's completely ugly, but people may think this way. Because all of this is mutable. It's, it's again, it's not object-oriented programming. It's a, it's a terrible design pattern if this is the data, data object. Data structure, data object, whatever. Plain data object. We discussed that. We don't do this. But the builder will be look like this. Class, employee, builder. In builder, I have these methods with name, with salary, with gender. And each method will return employee builder. Employee builder. Employee builder. It's called fluent interface as well. How do I call it? I say new employee builder dot with name. Jeff dot with gender uh, sorry see I'm confused as well male dot with age 23 dot build here I return employee so I created a builder and then I inject, inject, inject every time it returns itself. So it gets larger, larger, larger. And finally I say build and inside this method build, the constructor will be called and all five arguments injected. And what I didn't provide, I didn't provide the salary, I didn't provide the, the department. What will be injected there? You can make a guess. I'll help you. And of course, it's bad. That's why I call it bad design pattern. Because builder is necessary when we allow people to leave certain fields uninitialized. Uninitialized means null. And null means bad design practice. Okay? So I'm getting closer to the main point of this lecture. All previous are, were still technical things. And now I'm getting to the point which is philosophical and which, in my opinion, is the most important. Object thinking. You remember object thinking? We're all talking about object thinking. And object thinking was the term introduced by David West. David West, the professor from uh, the United States who wrote the book called Object Thinking. And in this book, he introduced actually everything which I'm telling you about. But not with the technical, uh, not with the technical uh, definitions like I'm doing. So I'm giving you Java code, uh, low-level practical examples, the design patterns. He didn't do that. He just introduced the philosophical concept. He said that we need to think about objects. We need to think like objects. We, can, we need to think about objects uh, like of, we think of people. So he introduced the idea of anthropomorphizing, anthrop anthropomorphization or anthropomorphizing uh, objects. Anthropomorphizing. I think anthropomorphizing. <laughs> yeah, I believe I wrote it correctly. So the bottom line is that we need to treat objects like people with respect, with the with the with an intent to uh, to uh, to deal with them. Uh, like creatures with, which live their own lives. 
and we respect their uh, their desire to uh, to live that life with their own rules <laughs> let's put it this way and now let's see how it looks for us this idea of null from the standpoint of uh, of this anthropomorphization of objects take a look at the left part don't don't look at this i do get department number 42 then i do from the department i do get me the employee by the name jeff and then this method get may return null what do i do I say if employee not equals to null, then I say print hello, hello Jeff. This is a very typic, typical Java code, how people deal with null. You get something from there, you are afraid of hitting the null, point, null pointer exception, so that's why you check, is it null? Read the right code. If we understand that objects are living creatures, that they are things that we respect, so this is how the conversation would look for us. Hello, is it the department number 42? Yes, I'm the department number 42. Let me talk to your employee, Jeff. They're waiting. Okay, hold the line. I'm going to find the employee, Jeff. Okay, hello. The employee, Jeff, is returned. And I'm saying, are you null? So it doesn't sound sane. It sounds wrong. We are expecting the guy who is replying to us to be Jeff. Or the system not, not, must crash. It's okay to crash at this point. Let's say, hold the line, please. Boom. The line is disconnected. That's okay. That's the situation from real life. We can imagine that. But can you, can you imagine in real life the situation like this? You're calling somebody. There's an answer there. Yes. Hello. Is it, please call me Jeff. The answer is yes. And you're saying, are you null? <laughs> that's that's the way how null looks and how checking for null looks in real code so when you do this validation you're basically completely disrespecting your objects you are telling them i don't care i don't think that you are an object i don't think that you are a living creature an organism whatever i don't care i think that you are nothing i'm going to check whether you are null or not null so i'm actually testing whether you're whether i can trust you whether i can believe that you're gonna work for me or you're some garbage which i need to throw away you don't answer you don't ask this question to a human being so why do we ask it to the to the object that's the that's the main problem with the null in object-oriented programming not the exceptions not the problems not the runtime errors these are all the things which are which are also important but less important this is the most important when you start checking for null when you start storing null you immediately lose respect to your objects you immediately lose idea of object-oriented programming you go down to the level of procedural programming now objects for you are just data storages are just bags with data so they are not anymore something which which ex which expose behavior and high data no now for you they are references to memory where in memory something is stored and this is not how it should be this is not what object oriented is about so now aside from what this guy said the tony Hoare, this guy aside from what he said he's right definitely all of this innumerable errors vulnerabilities system crashes that's all true but the main problem is respect we lose to our objects if we start making them turning them into null because in real life you don't you can't imagine that having an object with a name jeff which all of a sudden may be null okay make sense so we are finishing and uh, before we finish i'll show you some statistics from the famous frameworks called spring boot uh, again many years ago it was five years ago i posted a tweet uh, where i made a comparison of the number of uh, null 
mentioned in the source code of Spring Boot Framework. Look at what they have. Spring Boot Framework, uh, that was five years ago. I don't have the statistics now, but you can check it yourself. It's not so difficult. You can just uh, check out from GitHub. And if you find the numbers, please find them, send it to me, or maybe even maybe even contribute to the uh, to the slides and put the numbers there. So what, what is the actual numbers there by right now? So Spring Framework at the time of writing was 4,000 Java files, 243 lines of code, and 7,000 null keywords, which is one null per 39, 35 lines of code. This is how often they use null. 35 lines, null. 35, nine, five lines, null. So how much they respect their objects? My question is. And look at the takes framework, which I participated in the development of this framework, and we decided not to use null there because we believe that that's disrespectful to the objects. But sometimes we need to do it because, because we use external libraries, some JDK, for example, where null is actually being returned. So we need to deal with that. So we have less files, about how much? About seven times, six times less files. We have less lines of code, about two times less, maybe even less. And we have 58 null keywords, which is one null per 2,700 lines of code. This number and that number makes a difference. I believe it's a huge difference. So, so which quality is better? Which maintainability is better? Who deals with objects better? So check this number for your code. How often do you use null? Per how many lines of code? Because completely getting rid of null is not possible. In Java, you cannot get rid of null. In other languages as well, because there are libraries which were created by other programmers where they already use null. And they're going to return null to you and you need to check it. So it's, it's inevitable, unfortunately, in this world today to completely get rid of null. You need to use it. But if you don't use it in your code, then the number of, then this number will be quite high. And 2000 700 is quite a good number, I believe. But 35 is absolutely not a good number. Okay?